A few years ago, I was lucky enough to visit Jerusalem, and I know that Claudia is keen to get a screen up for you here. So the incentive is, if you had a screen, I can show you some nice holiday pictures. So, and now when I was, uh, and some of you I know will have travelled to Jerusalem too and seen for yourself. And um, one of the things I enjoyed doing in Jerusalem was you can go underground, because a lot of the old city is underground, and you do a tour underground, and you go under the city itself, the modern city, and you can go to the base of what would have been the Temple Mount, and there you can see what Jesus was talking about. And when I was there, these passages really came to life, because the stones truly are enormous to make this the Temple Mount. And uh, they still today don't fully know how they got them into place. And the guides will always show you one particular stone, and they'll point out that this stone weighs more than a fully laden jumbo jet. And it truly is massive. So that's what the disciples were talking about. They say, look at these huge stones. But if you go a bit further on around the corner, where the, uh, the level has been excavated down to the time of Jesus, uh, the, the streets of Jesus would have known. You can see, also see, great stones from the temple lying in a ruin. And that they have been left there since the day that the Romans destroyed the temple and literally pushed the stones off the edge. And there they have lain for 2,000 years. Truly, Jesus' words here were prophetic. The sadness for the Jews and for Jesus' later contemporaries, was that by the time of Jesus, the temple was really splendid once again, and was described by many observers as a wonder of the ancient world, ranking alongside the seven. As we say, the temple was rebuilt slowly in the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, and it slowly became a bit grander, and they added bits and bobs here, and it took on a life of its own. But then, at the time of Herod the Great, um, a few decades before the birth of Jesus, um, Herod the king, trying to ingratiate himself with his people, launched a massive rebuilding program, and he doubled the size of the temple, and it made it, again, a truly splendid thing. And uh, we have lots of um, what we would call, I suppose now, travel programs, travel logs from the ancient world, writers who travel to Jerusalem, and they spoke of how wonderful the temple was, how it was clad in marble, and again there was gold on the roof, and one of the great things to behold was the sun coming up over the Mount of Olives, hitting the roof of the temple, and it blazing like, it looked like it was on fire, because it was covered in gold. And pilgrims streamed to it, and that was the temple that Jesus and the disciples knew. And in Jesus' time, in fact, they were still finishing it. They were still weaving scaffolding around the place. Because in John's Gospel, uh, when Jesus confronts the money changers in the temple, some, some of them reply, the temple has been under construction for 46 years. But tragically, even after it was built, just as it was finished really, it was destroyed once again. In 66 AD, about 30 years or so after Jesus' death, residents of Jerusalem and Judea would rise in revolt against the Romans, and a few years later the temple was destroyed utterly in an orgy of death and destruction when the Romans recaptured the city after a long and bloody siege, and they literally did not leave one stone on top of the other, and they pushed them off the Temple Mount, so they crashed below. Jesus' words must have echoed in his disciples' ears, and this time the temple would never re-emerge from the dust. Now we know that long after the time of Jesus, Christians continued to worship in the temple, probably right until the time it was destroyed, and we know that they suffered greatly too at this time of persecution, and they must have wept at what was lost in its destruction. So how did Christianity, and indeed Judaism, survive the loss of the temple? We know that many cults didn't survive similar traumas. They survived, but really, because of the innovations from the time of the exile. Sacrifice and ritual were once again abandoned, but so much of the worshipping life of the community could carry on. They had their scriptures, beautifully preserved and copied now, 
all the Psalms, all the prophets. And of course now if you go to a Jewish synagogue, you'll see how carefully prized the scrolls are. They still have their festivals, including most of course importantly, Sabbath, and the Christians would take on Sunday worship. And they still had their assemblies, synagogues, or as they would become known, churches. It's interesting to know that in the letter of James, that one of the earliest bits of the New Testament to be written, the author still uses the word synagogue to describe the assembly of the Christians. Crucially though, in our Gospel reading and elsewhere, Jesus tried to show his disciples that their faith was not centred on a building, but on a person. God revealed in Jesus Christ, his Son, our Saviour. Again, quoting from John chapter 2, Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. And that has been the experience of Christ's followers in every age. That despite the destruction of its buildings, the burning of its books, the persecution of its people, the faith has remained alive. And, a fact we often forget in this corner of the world, Christ has never stopped adding followers to his name from the day of his resurrection to today. There are many parallels I can think of one that immediately springs to mind is the Christian church in China. Many of you will know the story of the church there and how Christian churches, uh, Western churches, sent missionaries to China for decades. And there were large numbers of missionaries operating in China uh, up until the time, during the revolution and up until the 20th century. And some of you, of course, will know the story of Gladys, Gladys Aylwell. Aylwell and her exploits. And when Chairman Mao came to power in 1948 and the Chinese Revolution took place, all Western missionaries were cleared out. They were ordered home. And uh, I've met some of them, I'm sure you have too, and the, the sadness they experienced of being driven out of what they considered to be their home. And the Western church thought, well, that's it. That's the end of Christianity in China, and it won't resurface again until we are allowed back in, until we send missionaries once more. But when the curtain in China began to raise in the 1980s and 90s, an incredible thing was found, and that was that the church in China was alive and flourishing, and with far more members than ever it had before. And the church in China had miraculously survived through house churches, through um, church through very brave people sharing the word one to one. And the Church of China today, of course, is going from strength to strength. During the pandemic, like many others, I regularly turned to the experience of exile and passages like the one we heard read from Ezra, as I sought to understand what was happening to us as we were driven from our buildings and familiar ways of worship. That particular passage from Ezra indeed came to my mind recently at the final service at the church in Witten. A very sad occasion when there was, when many of us felt like weeping. Uh, it was a good service, it was a good send-off for that church. But I think many of us found it very hard to sit and listen to people like Mary Patterson talk about the days of her youth at the church and what it was like church was full and there were Sunday school outings and uh, church parades and all the rest of it. There was, it was a time of weeping for those like in Ezra's time, the older priests and Levites who wept there, many of the older congregation, weeping at what had been lost. And it's a feeling that many of us are familiar with, especially if we have grown up feeling of sadness about what has been lost, about the glory days of the church when the churches were full and the Sunday schools had 48 classes and all the rest of it. There is an interesting parallel to the time of Jesus, though. 
in the time of Jesus, the, they talked about the temple and how wonderful it was. But of course, the temple they knew was only 40 or so years old. Before that, things had been done differently. And of course, the people of Israel had survived the trauma of the loss of the temple once before. In our own time, we can sometimes forget how new some of our churches are. At Barnes, we've uh, been doing a lot with the roof and such like, and we've been looking at the past. And we can think of a church like Barnes as being, having been there always. But it was only built in 1906, and it came about because Methodists in Hammersmith were trying to witness to the gypsy encampment on Barnes Common. I wonder what happened if there were a gypsy encampment on Barnes Common today. It, the building came about because people wanted to gather. And then, of course, they created a building and an institution. And then, of course, you get involved in keeping the building going and not really the life of the church sometimes. So much of what we take as normal is actually an innovation. And I'm sure our organist has read Hardy's Under the Greenwood Tree and knows about the terrible, um, terrible rumblings in a little country village when they tried to introduce this newfangled invention, the pipe organ, and how terrible that was. The story of the temple, the story of God's people, reminds us that God is always revealing new things to us, and new things about God's self. And the Bible and the story of our people continually point us back to the truth that our faith is not centred on a building or an institution or even upon particular ways of worshipping. It is centred on the person of God revealed in his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And God, working through the Holy Spirit, will continue to reveal new things to us. And we have learned new things about God in the time of the pandemic, which for many of us may have felt like a time of exile when we were forced out of our buildings. And we need to learn the lessons of that time. As a circuit, we are looking to the future now and thinking about what our vision for the future is. We're going to hold a big vision day on the 20th of November, to which you are all very warmly welcome and invited. And at, uh, this week, one of the uh, big things in my diary is Tuesday night when we are thinking about putting together a, what you might call a job description for a new minister to come here and work. We pray God's blessing upon that. We have no idea if, what will happen. But we know that the new person who comes will be working in different ways. And they won't just be working in the church. They'll be working to try and create new communities as well, we hope and pray. And it will be scary. And it will be different. And there will be, we pray, there will be, we know, weeping and sadness. But by God's grace, there will also be rejoicing and joy as well as we discover that nothing can constrain the God whom we worship. Nothing can limit God. And God will continue to reveal new truths about God to us. New ways of understanding his scriptures. New ways of being his people. In these days of challenge and change, let us cling to the truth that never changes, that God chose to reveal God's self in the person of Christ our Saviour, who died upon a cross for you and for me, and whose love knows no bounds and no end. Together, we step forward in faith.